Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I have the privilege and the honor to welcome a personal friend of mine, someone that I've gotten to know well over the years. He is a man of God. He is a husband and a father, a family man. He is what I would say one of the true, true individuals that walks in an identity of an evangelist and a prophet who, uh, you know, is that hyphenated, for lack of a better word, but truly wants to see souls saved, want to see people set free, want to see the captives set free, isn't afraid of demons, devils, witches, warlocks, or whatever the case may be. Uh, he's an individual that I admire, I respect, and I'm grateful for his friendship and the relationship that we have to help further advance the kingdom. Without further ado, I want to welcome this week's guest of the podcast, Chad McDonald. And Chad, thank you so, so much for those of you that are listening or watching. You don't know uh, necessarily who Chad is and not familiar with his ministry. Chad, would you kind of give everybody just an update of who you are, family man, all the other stuff that we can get to know who is Chad McDonald? Amen. Listen, I'm honored to be here on the Blacksmith Chronicles uh, with you. Uh, it's my esteemed honor here to be here and, and just breaking bread and talking about kingdom things. And so those of you that may not be aware of who I am and what I do, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a husband. Um, I am a man of God. I'm a preacher of the gospel. And I believe that the anointing to God to to set captives free, to destroy yokes and to remove burdens. That anointing is active still and available in the earth today, but I believe that it's operating today in an increased manner than ever before. And so I'm just trying to do my part in the harvest field. And so, um, you know, this ministry, Revival Fire World Ministries, we're active um, in missions work all over the world. And as you know, um, I do a lot of stuff in the 1040 window in areas where uh, you know, it would put my life on, on, on risk on a regular basis to be in some of these places. Um, but we do, we do miracle crusades. Um, I do apostolic equipping sessions for pastors, for ministers in many of these countries to see them equipped by the power of God. And, and of course, as a revivalist, I travel itinerantly, you know, across the country and the world, but um, preaching the gospel uh, with signs following and equipping the body of Christ. That's that's my passion. That's my drive. That's my goal to see a return to true Pentecostal power in the earth today. A vibrant, like Paul said, that my preaching was not just in the demonstration, but in, in words only, but in demonstration and power of the spirit. And so you can check us out at www.revivalfirewm.com. Um, you can get, get more information about the ministry there. Or follow us on social media at Revival Fire WM. That's the handle for most you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, Parler, they're all the same. And those things are all available to you there. So that's, that's just a little bit about myself. Well, you, um, naturally you want to see people born again. You want to see people set free, but in that setting free, uh, you're an individual, you are a deliverance guy. You believe in the power of being set three set free uh, through deliverance, you definitely don't shy away from demons or uh, demonic oppression, possession, whatever the, yeah. the title word that most people want to you know, say. Why do you feel like deliverance is one of those areas that so many people aren't willing to engage yeah. in conversation and walk that out? Well, I think there's a, uh, there's a couple. Uh, number one, poor theology. It's it's poor theology on the part of many. Um, you know, when we get into the when we get into the question, everyone I'll just go ahead and hit the first one right in the head. Can a Christian have a devil? Or can a Christian be demonized? Or some people use the word possession. I don't prefer the word possession because there's a difference between that and demonization. Um, and that that's a huge breakdown. But so people get caught up on that. And so they 
they ignore the activity of demon power in the lives of believers and in the lives of those in the church because they just assume that demons can afflict believers. And so it's sometimes it's poor theology or it's poor training or lack of understanding. And then other times it's the ostrich with the head buried in the sand mentality. But I'll just bury my head in the sand. And as long as I don't see it, as long as I don't feel that it's there, we'll just ignore it and move on with life. And then the other, the other area is kind of tied into all of the other two that I just mentioned is that the West is operating in an atheistic worldview. There are two main worldviews, no matter where you are on the planet. There's a supernatural worldview, and then there's an atheistic worldview. Now, here in the West, the majority of the church, sad to say, but Western culture has so permeated the church in, in many ways that many are operating under an atheistic worldview. And I say that to, to tie it into this. In the East, and people would call me the third world, which I don't really prefer to use that term, but in, in the Eastern world, you know, whether we're talking any Africa, Asia, um, you know, other places in, in those manners, the majority of the world outside of the West, meaning Western Europe and the United States, for example, operates under a supernatural worldview. Now, what I mean is this. What I'm preaching in, whether it's Central Africa, Northern Africa, Pakistan, wherever it is, I don't have to convince people of the supernatural realm. I don't have to convince people that there is a God. I, I don't run into atheists in Central Africa. I don't run into atheists in Pakistan. I don't run into atheists in the Caribbean. I don't run into atheists in South America or any of those places. I run into atheists in the United States. And in those places, you don't run into really atheists. Now, I'm not saying maybe there are some, but by and large, for the most part, culture there has a supernatural worldview. They view everything through the lens of the supernatural. Whatever happens to them for the good or the poor, they tie into a supernatural cause. Now, in many of those places, they're bound by witchcraft, they're bound by animism and different forms of occultic type beliefs, spirit worship and 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 all of those kind of things. And in the Middle East, they're tied into Islam and all that kind of stuff. Now, that this to say that is though they may be involved in those religions, they all understand a supernatural realm. They all are aware that it exists. And so you don't you don't deal with the atheistic barrier that's in the West. And so in those places, they understand spirits. They understand um, demonic influences. And, and so they'll come for deliverance many times. And so you don't, you don't have to, to deal with that. You don't have really to have to address that. I just preach Jesus there. I preach Jesus as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He himself is God. Besides him, there is none other. He has all power and authority. When they see, when they see the power of Jesus manifested in, in great authority and power with signs following, to them, there's no question. There's no question. You know, in our recent crusade in Uganda, um, more than 50% of all the people that came to Christ in that crusade were of Muslim background. And when we asked them, you know, with the follow up, um, cards and, and all that we had passed out to try to you know get them plugged into local fellowships and all that kind of stuff so that discipleship can be can be done. The number one question that was asked what what was one of the things that convinced you the most in the and that Jesus was Lord? They said these were Muslims. Now they said when well, we saw the power of Jesus to deliver people from demon possession because the imams couldn't do that, the witch doctors can't do that. But the power of Jesus instantly would be delivering. We, I mean, brother, I've been in places where I, I've cast hundreds, I've cast demons out of hundreds and hundreds of people in single services, you know, and it's a, it's another day at the office. And so when you get into the West, the reason why you ask that question, why do people ignore this is because they have that atheistic mentality. Instead of a supernatural worldview, they have, we, we have this atheistic worldview that Everything can be explained away. Everything is explained away here in the West with science, with um, pseudo-psychology, humanistic belief, 
Um, everything can be explained away. And so there's a process that's begun in our academia and in our academic faculties, especially in the places that train the gen next generation of preachers and in these places. And so the, it's, it's not just the world anymore that's atheistic, but it's creeping into the church. And so people don't look to God first any longer. They look to medicine or science or, or philosophy or humanistic type teaching. I mean, you got humanistic teachings in the pulpits now instead of the Bible. You know, we've got all this self-help life coaching. I can't find a life coach in a five-fold ministry in Ephesians 4 nowhere. <laughs> I mean, where does it say life coach, right? Right. We'll leave that alone. You didn't, you didn't bring me on here to talk about that, but you know me. We just <laughs> I end up in areas like that. But that's, that's, the main, that's one of the reasons that deliverance is ignored and avoided in the way that it is, is because much of the church just don't believe they exist. They don't believe that they exist. For some reason, they have a naive view that demons aren't active in the United States. That's only the foreign mission field, perhaps. Well, last time I checked, America has never been in more need of deliverance ministry now than ever before. The problem is, is demons hide better here than they do there. They, for example, they don't hide, you know, in places like Africa or, or Central Asia because they're not used to having to hide. Darkness has had to grip there for so long. So when light shows up, the smallest light causes manifestations. And, and when you show up to preach the gospel there, they're like when, when Jesus came into the synagogue. I know who you are. If you come to torment us before the appointed time, they didn't expect to see you there. When that anointing authority walks in here in the West, they have been able to hide in that behind that atheistic mentality. And so the demons don't want to manifest. They don't prefer to manifest. They would like to stay hidden. And so they'll stay hidden as long as they can. Two things cause them to manifest authority and anointing. When anointing walks into a room, it will cause them to manifest, but more than anointing, is authority, real spiritual authority. When you have a track record in deliverance ministry, you can walk into a room and they will take note. They get nervous because they understand, they can see the anointing and the authority that you walk into. You know, it's like this when I was in the military. Privates walk like privates and generals walk like generals. And what I mean is this. When we would be in a formation or in our unit, Authority could walk in the room without you seeing them, and you could sense it. I remember we'd get a surprise inspection from a sergeant major, somebody like that. And he, would, he could walk in the room, brother. He could walk in the room behind you, and you could feel an atmosphere shift. You could feel authority came into that room. And, you know, so someone who has authority, they carry that. And that's in the physical realm. In the spiritual realm, it's, it's magnified greater. So when you walk, and that's what made them manifest in the synagogue when Jesus came. That, that young man in the synagogue had been going there his whole life. The first person Jesus cast a demon out of, becoming, going there the whole life. He was a church guy or a synagogue guy. And I believe he believed in Yahweh. He believed in the Torah. He had been coming, but he had been bound. And something changed that day when Jesus stepped in to that synagogue. What changed? The atmosphere shifted because of the authority and the anointing. This was not church as usual any longer. Jesus walked in there, and those spirits had perceived that, and they understood it. So that's, that's, that's part of the reason why we, we deal here in, in much of the, the American church, if you will, or the Western church, where people in many areas forsake deliverance ministry because, one, they're ignorant of it. Two, they don't believe in it. Or three, they've just got plain poor theology. You know, those, that's really, I think, the, the best summary that I could think of. So let me ask you this, because, uh, you know, I've been in the services, and you, you have the question that comes up. Yeah. Can a Christian have mm -hmm. a demon? Which you, you just touched on just a little bit. Yeah. And I, I, I want to know, I want to ask you, am yeah. I wrong in my personal thinking, I, I, I've mm. come to the point where I've said, I think we're asking the wrong question. Right. We're asking, can a Christian have a demon? I think mm. the right question is, what can a Christian have? Yeah. And, and the reason I'm saying that is, if you study scripture, 
a, a, a son of God is yeah. a very powerful being. So mm -hmm. if a Christian chooses to incorporate whatever they incorporate, they have right. that right to do so. Is that mentality or that understanding, that theology, is that wrong? No, let me, let me try to explain it the best that I can. Because there are those that will shut, shut you off right away. If you even mention the possibility that a Christian can have a demon operating on the inside, they'll say, well, I believe they can be oppressed, but they can't be demonized. And, and many people, especially in a lot of the mainline areas, will shut you off. But I've never met one individual that's active in deliverance ministry that has not cast a demon out of a believer. Unfortunately, I've been in pastor's conferences and cast just as many demons out in those areas than I have in the crusades. Now, people are like, okay, well, give me scripture. Okay, so let me help you with this. First off, the problem, I think, is the word possession and demonization. When, in, in the New Testament, when it mentions a, a person having a demon, the, the Greek word is the word actually more accurately translated demonized. Okay. And, and many of the English versions, we use the word possession. Possession deems ownership. Okay. If we're talking about a believer, they don't have ownership. Demonization is like this. Actually, this was a true story. There, there was a, a report. It's actually in my book. I, I put the part of this in my book, but there was a family that had moved into a home. They bought this home and they had been living there for some time. And during the course of them living in this home, they owned the home. Their name was on the deed. Odd things started happening in the home. They started noticing things being out of place, odd sounds and things of that nature. And so it these would happen when they would leave the house and they would come back. Uh, they would see these things moving and or they wouldn't see them moving. They would notice things had been moved out of place. And so they were doing, they decided to do some remodeling one day. They did some remodeling in the attic area. And when they had knocked down a wall in the attic area, they found that someone had been living behind that wall. A squatter had been living back there behind that wall for, for months, if not a year or more. <laughs> Since before, before they bought the house, was squatting in a, in a compartment of the attic of that house, okay, <laughs> unauthorized but was living there. You're laughing because you know I'm going somewhere. Was living there unauthorized, a squatter. Demons are like those squatters. Demons will operate, they operate through access that are granted. Access is granted to the spirit realm through participation in some cases into things. Sometimes it's granted through bloodline um, so, because people were dedicated and things like that to, to the to the underworld and to things like that. Um, demons operate through what we call in, in churches. We use words like portal for those that might be listening that aren't quite sure what a portal is. It's no different than an open window or an open door. It's a portal is an area. It's a gate of access. You just step through a portal. Demons operate through open portals and open portals can be many things in a life. Obviously unrepentant sin is an open portal. I found in my course of deliverance ministry, that there are three main portals that the common denominator of people that are in need of serious deliverance from demonization have opened up three uh, portals in three main areas. Now there are other areas, but three of the main areas, first one is occultic involvement. People who have had involvement currently or in the past with the occult, uh, whether we're talking about, you know, witchcraft. And, and when I say witchcraft, I'm talking about black magic, white magic, red magic. Most people in the West don't even know what red magic is. But, um, uh, you know, yoga, um, new age belief systems, Freemasonry, um, you know, I mean, Native American rituals. I could really hit that one hard. Everyone's afraid to touch that. Native American rituals. Okay. Um, any of these um, type of occultic belief systems, tarot cards, horoscopes, astrology, in, in all of those areas, I mean, literally, I, I, you know, I could take an entire show we could just on that. But any involvement in that or people who bring those objects into their home. You know, the word of God commanded Israel not to bring any accursed item into their home for it would become an accursed to them. 
And so it's important not to do it. Here's the thing. When you open those portals, demons don't care that you meant it or not. They don't care that you did it ignorantly. If you bring an item that's dedicated to them into your home or you participate in occultic things that are dedicated to the worship of them or the communication with them, they don't care if you did it innocently or not. They just care you opened the door. A burglar doesn't care if you accidentally left your window unlocked or not or you left it open for them to come in. And so a portal is like opening these areas. You leave a window open, then you go to bed at night and you end up with critters in your house or you end up with burglars in your house. The demons are the same way. So that's portal number one, the occult, occultism. Portal number two is sexual immorality. You know, whether it's fornication um, and, and fornication really encompasses all sexual sin, but you know, we're talking about homosexuality, transgenderism, you know, any of the, those perverse acts. Um, sex outside the bounds of marriage, whether you're married, or whether you're male, still male and female, but you're not married together, that's still sin. And so any of those areas, you know, pornography, masturbation, all of those things will open up portals in your life. And so demons will come in. And then the third area is drug abuse. That's the, one of the third main area. Why? Because when people um, use mind altering substances, whether it's drugs or intoxicants and things like that, they are actually opening their spirit up. That's what happens at that euphoric level when you get high. That's why people enjoy getting high because they leave the natural realm in a sense and they get a heightened state of euphoria. What they're actually sensing is their spirit being opened. And so demons can, can come in and, and end up infesting lives through those things. And oftentimes what happens is when you deal with like, when you go into occultic programs and services and, and rituals, they incorporate all three of those portals. Every occultic ritual includes sexual immorality. They almost all include drug use. And so they incorporate all three of those things together. So those are three main portal areas. So demons gain entrance and access through an opening of portal, but there are others. Those aren't the only ones. I mean, unforgiveness is a huge portal, but there are many of portals in the life of a person. And so what we don't un understand when we, we start asking that question about can a believer have a demon? Well, you can have anything you want to have, like you kind of alluded to. And what I mean by is this. Now, sometimes we ask the question, you know, we don't ask the question, well, what kind of believer are we talking about? Because there's more than one type of believer. You've got those that are saved and sanctified and on fire for God and filled with the Holy Spirit and they're walking right and they're living right. And then you've got nominal Christians. Nominal Christians are a far greater risk for things like that. Um, we ignore the vastness of the human soul. The human soul is so vast. Jesus cast a demon out of a man who identified himself as legion. Now, this man had, depending on what Bible scholar you use, they say as little as 800 demons and as many as 2,000. I don't know how many, but 800 is a lot and 2,000 is a lot. You're on the losing end of that, on that, whether you got 800 demons or 2,000. <laughs> it don't really matter at that point, right? I mean, you pretty messed up. Yeah. So, but one man, now think about this. One man, his soul, his spirit was vast enough to hold at least 800 to 2,000 demon spirits. One person, one person's soul was that vast. Okay. How much more Holy Spirit could you hold if you were really yielded to him? Mm. Think about that. 800 de one demon is enough to mess you up. One. One, they're supernatural beings. Okay? They are supernatural beings. One of them is enough to mess you up. Yeah. 800 or more, one man had. How much Holy Spirit could you have if you were yielded to God? How much? We asking the wrong question. How much Holy Ghost could you have? And so that's the reason Peter's shadow healed the sick. That's the reason Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons brought deliverance and healing. People like that were yielded to God. And so, but the vastness of the human soul, and there's, it's compartmentalized. And so oftentimes believers end up with demon issues from their prior existence. From, from before they were born again in some cases, and sometimes afterwards. In my book, I talk about this. If you study the early church for the first three, 
three centuries, three or four centuries, the early church made deliverance from demons a part of the process of conversion. Before they would baptize you, they would take you through deliverance. They would take you through deliverance. Many of the, the councils write about this. The Calvary was the Council of Trent and a few of the others. They, they talk about this before, mm-hmm. because you're talking about the, the gospel, the kingdom message had spread into many of these places that were completely demonized. They'd worship demons, occultism, and demon worship was an ingrained part of their DNA. Generations to generations worshiped demons and invited them in. So now the gospel has penetrated this. You're dealing with people who have been demonized through generational lines. So deliverance was important, and they understood this, and they encountered this. And so the early church, and it's in the book, but the early church made deliverance ministry a part of the conversion. Prior to baptism, they would go through deliverance. And when anyone who had fallen away would come back, when they would rebaptize a convert, they would always take them through deliverance. It was that important. People ignored deliverance ministry because they say it's messy. It may be messy, and it surely is messy. But let me tell you something. Undeliverance is far more messier. Undeliverance is way more messier. That's why we've got people with so many issues and problems, and they've got identity issues, and they've got um, insecurity issues, and they've got sexual issues, and they've got um, – you know, all these other issues, anger issues and unforgiveness issues, and, and they've got night terrors, and they've got all these things going on, and they've come, they, they love God. Just because you have these issues does not mean that you've not been saved. It doesn't mean yeah. you don't love God. He wants you to be free. And the church ignores the fact that Jesus wants to deliver them too. Deliverance is actually the children's bread. Jesus told the Syrophoenician woman that deliverance was not even for the Gentile. He called her a dog. He called this woman a dog. Said it is not fit to give the dog's food to someone like you. Or not, not fit to give the children's bread to a dog like you. That's what he said. He called this woman a dog. Because deliverance came first for the believer. Okay? It, sure, it's to the unbeliever. But, the, but the, the, many in the church need this. I mean, I could tell you over and over about whether they're Sunday school teachers or whomever they need having to go through deliverance because they're bound with issues. You know, when I, when I've got somebody and they're rolling around on the floor and their eyes rolling back in their head and uh, they're growling at me, foaming at the mouth. I don't stop and be like, Oh, well you couldn't possibly have a demon. You've been a Sunday school teacher for 20 years. I don't get into all that. I just look at that. devil and say, you devil come out in the name of Jesus. You know, I worry about setting them free. I don't ask all those crazy questions. And the man, with is, the man with the experience is never at the mercy of those with the argument. You know, so they can believe all they want, but I've encountered it, and I don't get into all that stuff. Well, they can't have this because they've been in the church so long. And then people say, well, they, just, they were never saved. That's what they say. Well, they were just never saved, or they wouldn't have had that issue. I believe that they were saved. Now, here's the deal. Do we or do we not believe that when someone gives their heart to the Lord, they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth. The Bible says they're saved. That's what Romans says. So when I go to a crusade and, and they come by the hundreds or the thousands and they give their life to Jesus, the tears coming down their face, their hands are lifted, okay? And they're praying, they're calling out to Jesus. They're declaring him as Lord. Are they not saved the moment they say that? They are. Yet the minute I start to pray for those people, they'll start falling over like popcorn, manifesting. Many times I don't have to touch them. I'll just begin to rebuke the devil over their life. I'll say, Satan, you listen to me now. You have no more authority in their life. They have confessed Jesus as their Lord. Now in the name of Jesus, I break your power. I mean, I say that they'll fall. The entire mass rolling around, shaking, gyrating. They're now being delivered from demons, but they've already been saved. So if a believer couldn't have a demon, what, what's, how in the world are they now being delivered? If they were delivered, in, if they were saved instantly. So there's a vastness of a human soul. What's happening is the Holy Spirit is evicting those spirits from areas that they have been squatting in their life that are unauthorized. They're unauthorized areas in their life. You know, I, <laughs> there, politically and, and all that in our nation, there's been a lot of talk about things like visas and illegal immigration. 
Well, the devil is the ultimate illegal alien. <laughs> Satan had a visa to operate in this earth because of Adam's sin. It was granted to him. When I go into any nation, most nations, some don't require visas, but most nations require visas. They're typically for 30 days to six months in some cases. That visa says what my purpose is in that nation. And if I operate under a different purpose, I can be thrown out of that nation. And it says how long I'm allowed to be in that nation. It has an entry date and it has a date that I have to be out by. If I overstay my visa, I can be arrested. If I enter without a visa, I'm illegal. Now, in any nation but the United States, that's a problem. That's not a problem. You know, if you, have, if you don't have a visa and you're in any other nation, no one thinks twice about yoking you up, arresting you, and throwing you into jail. My, my analogy is for this reason. Satan had a visa 2,000 years ago, or prior to 2,000 years ago. He had a visa granted to him through Adam's sin. But 2,000 years ago on the cross, on Calvary's cross, the blood of Christ shed that poured out of his side and through his hands and his feet that was ripped like ribbons off of the back off of his back the blood of jesus when he declared those words it is finished satan's visa was revoked when jesus reached down when he went down and took the keys of death hell and the grave from satan and kicked the end of the tomb out and on the third day rose from the grave with all power and authority jesus said in matthew 28 all authority has now been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, I say unto you, or in other words, all authority has now been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And because of that, now I say to you, go into all the world. Jesus was now delegating that authority. But he said, all authority has been given unto me. So if Jesus has all authority, how much authority does that leave the devil? It leaves him zero authority. Satan has zero authority now post-resurrection operate in the earth. Zero authority. Now, I didn't say he didn't have power. He does have power. He's a supernatural being, but he has zero authority. Zero authority. Jesus didn't just give us dunamis, Holy Spirit power. He gave us authority. We have the legal jurisdiction. The ecclesia is a legal jurisdictive body. The church, the ecclesia, we have been given legal jurisdiction in the earth to reach into heaven and to grant, grab heaven's decrees and to manifest them or to enforce them, to bring them into the earth. We have been giving, we, we have been empowered as heaven's bail enforcement agents. We have been empowered as heaven's border patrol. We have been empowered to equip, to, to, to equip the believers, but we have been empowered to, de to deliver and to cast out and to root out squatters out of the lives of individuals that don't belong. And when somebody comes to Christ, that access has been revoked in their life. And demonic activity in their life is illegal. It is illegal. And so that's what deliverance ministry is. Deliverance ministry is removing illegal aliens. Well, let me ask you this, though, because... I will easily chalk up um poor theology or yeah. no theology for a lot of western christianity mm -hmm. but th there's this modern movement within our culture to be relevant right to be uh culturally accepted do you aside from the poor theology aside from the bad theology or no theology at all aside from the um just lack of faith in general. Do you feel like the media and Hollywood has glamorized the demonic? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. In, in a way to where you have a lot in Western Christianity, yeah. they don't necessarily denounce it, but they don't necessarily separate themselves from it. You know, Paul says that we are to separate ourselves mm -hmm. from this. But it, yeah. it, it feels like, it looks like, and it sounds like so much of Western Christianity have or has embraced so much of a demonic realm because it is mm. culturally relevant. You know, it, it's the hip, the cool thing to be a part of. And we've dumbed down a mm. demonic influence. So do you see that in the Hollywood, yeah. in the media? Yeah, man, you... Um... 
you we're really about to unpack some stuff here, but here's the thing, man. We are caught up in this relevant mentality. Everybody wants to be so relevant. I mean, we're caught up in, it doesn't matter whether you got an anointing or not. We just care that your outfit's good. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't listen. It don't matter. It doesn't matter in some of these circles, how anointed you are. Long as you got the nice, you got the Jordans on or you got the nice shoes and, and your outfit is fly and you are, you know, trendy or whatever the case may be. Okay. And here's the deal. We, we think that I got to be like you to set you free. Okay. So we, we equate relevance in that way that I got to be like you. Listen, I don't have to have AIDS to deliver you from it. I deal with it. the spirit of AIDS. Same way I do any other spirit. I was in Uganda. Six women came up. Said, you foul spirit of HIV, AIDS. You come out of them in the name of Jesus. They came back the following money with a doctor's report, no HIV in their body. You know, I don't have to have AIDS to set you free. I don't have to have cancer to deliver you from cancer. I don't have to have any. That's crazy. I don't have to look like you. As a matter of fact, you're not supposed. The world has become so churchy and the church become so worldly. We can't tell the difference no more. Holiness is what God does, but you play a part in your sanctification. There's a big difference between the two. Yeah, we are instantly sanctified when we give our life to Jesus. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us. But Paul said that we should know how to possess our vessel in what? Sanctification, correct? How can Paul is pretty much saying you need to know how to do this thing? You have to understand how to possess your vessel. In sanctification and honor. Then he goes on and talks about the things you should flee from, fornication and uncleanness and all those other things. You know, sanctification and holiness are two different things. Sanctification deals with setting apart for purpose. You have been set apart or dedicated for a purpose. If you are used outside of that purpose, you have defiled your purpose of sanctification. You know, you know, I, I've got a laptop sitting here, right? This laptop is, this is dedicated for purpose, okay? Now, could I take this laptop and fold it up and stack books on top of it and put a coffee cup on it? I could do that, but that's not its purpose. Its purpose is to be, you know, I write books on it. I do ministry things with it. So I honor its purpose by using it only for what it's intended for. We have been sanctified unto God. We've been separated for his purpose, for his works, not for the works of darkness or uncleanness. And so when we take our members and yield themselves to uncleanness, we are being used outside the purpose of the kingdom. And I'm not talking about, you know, your, your purpose as far as your fivefold calling. I'm talking about your purpose as a son, your purpose to, to walk righteously before God. When you operate outside of that, you've defiled yourself. And so um, we're seeking relevance. You want to really be relevant? Get an anointing. That'll make you relevant. That'll make, because here's the deal, man. Say that. True relevance has nothing to do with the way you look, the way you sound or any of that. And listen, I love all that stuff. I like shoes just as much as my wife does. I just don't have as many as she does, but I like them. <laughs> now, I like all that stuff. Okay, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But true relevance has nothing to do with the packaging. True relevance has to do with the message. True relevance has to do with the result. Because when someone comes in bound on heroin, or they're bound with demonic torment, or they're in a wheelchair, or they're just bound by sin, okay, they come in and they want to be free. They want to be free from anger. They want to be free from a life without God and an eternity in hell. They want to be free from torment. They want to be free from pain in their body. Real relevance has nothing to do with whether or not you've got $700 jeans on and a $400 pair of Nikes. Real relevance is you've got an anointing on your life. You can look at that person and you can introduce them to the one that can deliver them. You can put your hand on them and command that infirmity to leave their body. You can command those spirits to loose their mind. That's real relevance because what the world, what the West really wants 
and what society wants. They want relevance. They want real relevance. But the church, you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. Jesus said, go and preach. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. Freely have you received, now freely give. But you can't give what you don't have. I like Thai food, but I can't go in a Thai restaurant and order a taco. It's not on the menu. You cannot give what you don't have. And so people are covering up their lack of anointing. They're covering up their lack of authority in the spirit realm. They've had a form of godliness and deny the power. They cover it up with relevance, with what they think is real relevance. So they dress it up, but the people come in bound and they leave bound. They come in sick and they leave sick. They come in afflicted and they leave afflicted. They come in in sin. And because they believe in popping Budweiser's with the men's group on Wednesday night, they don't ever get delivered from alcoholism because they haven't understood that my Bible still says, you can look it up. Those that are listening on this podcast, you can look, I don't have a trick Bible, but my Bible still says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Yes. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Listen, that's New Testament. I hope that's redemptive enough for everybody's theology, but that's New Testament. That's Paul quoting the Old Testament, but it's still relevant for us today. And so when we step outside of those bounds, we open ourselves up. But, but like you said, man, Hollywood glamorizes this stuff. You know, a believer has no business watching any of those demonic films. You know, listen, some of you grew up watching them. I grew up watching some of them, yeah, Exorcist and Amityville Horror. And now they've got just even crazier ones out now. But don't watch that. The Conjuring, all of those things. Don't watch that garbage. First off, that stuff will open up your home. Because what ha- they're like, the people laugh, say, well, how in the world is just, it's just actors and it's fake? How could that open a portal up? Let me tell you how it opens a portal up. Demon spirits, watching spirits, they see the familiar spirits attached to your life, see what you are entertained by. They see what you gratify yourself on. And when they see you bringing that into your home, they, they send out word in the spirit realm. They say, hey, man, check this out. And more of them show up. Well, they've granted us access. They just sat there for two hours and enjoyed, in their spirit, man, enjoyed watching this portrayal. So they've opened themselves up. Now, some of those movies are outrightly dedicated to Satan in the production room. In the, in the, in the, the, people don't even realize that. Stuff's been dedicated to the demonic. Most of those movies have been. And so that stuff, but here's the other thing too. What does it glorify? Those movies glorify the power of the devil because in every one of those movies, it look, it, they make the, the demonic look like they have all the power and they make the man of God look like he's not even sure he should be there. They make him, whether it's the priest or the preacher or whatever, they make it look like you know, he barely came out alive at the end. And sometimes he doesn't even make it out alive. But, but it's always the, the spirit realm has the upper hand. Listen. When I walk into the room, it ain't like the exorcist, okay? They don't have the upper room. The minute I come in there, they know that their days are numbered. Their moments are numbered, okay? I don't, I don't need holy water or a rosary bead or, or, or all of that stuff. I walk into there, to that room, look at that person in the eyes and say, in, in the name of Jesus, you foul devil, come out of them. And the power of the devil is broken off the lives of the people. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's Hollywood has glamorized. Now, you know, are there things that happen in deliverance ministry that are similar? Yeah. Is there levitation? Is there, you know, people contorting and all? Sure. Those things all happen, but every case, here's, here's the deal. Every case of deliverance is not at that level. I mentioned something called demonization earlier. There are different levels to demonization. Um, there, there, you know, there's light, there's medium, and then there's serious levels of demoniz- demonization. Most, most believers are really only in that light area. And when you get into that ser- the, the serious level, which is more closely associated with what you would probably call possession, where the, where the individual has almost no mental capacity and no con- self-will control, that, th- th- those people are not believers. Those are unbelievers when they get to that level. Um, but there are different levels, there are different levels and different categories of demonization. Jesus spoke, he said, This kind comes out not but by prayer and fasting. The Greek word for kind is the Greek word ethnos, 
which is where we get the word ethnic group. Okay, he was speaking of a classification of spirits. There is a, there's a structure, there's a different classification. Jesus said that when a man is delivered and the house has been swept clean, if it's not been filled, he'll go and get seven spirits more wicked than themselves. Mm -hmm. so Jesus himself mentions there are those at a different level. Um, uh, you know, so Hollywood has glamorized much of this and it has messed up the mentality and even the theology in many cases. And then people look at deliverance ministry as being spooky. And yes, it's also been hurt by um, squirrely preachers or ministers, you know, ministering this stuff. You know, here's the deal, man. I, I suppose a book on deliverance is probably a dime a dozen. Everybody seems to have a book on deliverance now, but half of these folks don't actually cast devils out of nobody. You know, it's, it's important. It's important when, when you're dealing with this stuff that you not only are theologically sound, but you're dealing with somebody that knows what they're doing. Yeah. That, that operate in this um, on a regular basis. And the, you know, the, the real thing about it is at the end of the day, it's got to glorify Jesus. You know, it's not theatrics. It's not, I, listen, there's some craziness going on in some of this deliverance ministry. There's craziness in some of this stuff, you know, I, you know, my spiritual grand grandfather, Dr. Summerall, was not one to mess around with. You know, he, he didn't, he, he cast demons out probably on accident than more people do on purpose. <laughs> and um, I just, you know, I, I don't buy into all this. You know, I, I don't permit that. I don't permit all this. You know, when they try to manifest with these vulgar displays of power, you put an end to it. That's what you do. You put an end to it. You command them to stop. Tell them to shut up. You know, I don't get into this. I have conversations with demons. I don't do that stuff. You know, the only conversation I have is a one way conversation. Come out. That's it. You know, I, I don't, I don't need to, first off, the devil's a liar. What you want to hold a conversation with him for? He's not going to tell you the truth. <laughs> That's what I've said for years personally myself. Yeah. Why am I going to yeah. ask a lying demon? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to lie to me. Right. Now, let me ask you this, though. You have a book out uh, on uh, a Delilah spirit. Yeah. You have the most infamous uh, spirit ever mentioned and often mentioned is a yeah. uh, spirit of Jezebel. Yeah. Um, and you have the other side of Christians that say there is no such of a Delilah spirit. There is no such of yeah. a Jezebel spirit. There mm -hmm. is no such of a Judas spirit and all this and so on and so forth. Can you explain a little bit of yep. what that, and, and when you talk about these yeah. types of spirits and you identify a name attached mm -hmm. to it, can you just break that down so that people understand what exactly you're saying? Okay, here's the deal. I believe it was Chronicles. When the king was being deceived and the spirit went before Jehovah, Yahweh, and said, I will go as a lying spirit. Okay. He was asking permission because the king's rebellions and disobedience, he had opened a portal. And so they still had to get permission to even touch him because they'd still been anointed. My whole purpose is this when he said, as a lying spirit. So when I say a jet, demons often associate themselves in areas of preference, uh, you know, evil spirits often will have areas that they prefer to attach themselves, whether they're spirits of unforgiveness, spirits of sexual sin. They're all demons. All of those things are evil spirits, whether it's, you know, we're talking, we say someone has, it's a spirit of Delilah or listen, if, if, if we're talking about spirit of Jezebel, spirit of Delilah now, then what spirit did they have? Like what spirit did Jezebel get? You know what I mean? Like Jezebel wasn't possessed with the spirit of Jezebel. She was Jezebel. Right. See what I'm saying? So who, right. what was she like? The spirit of like, you know, Marianne or something before that? What I'm saying, it's a spirit likened unto them. Okay. The same spirit or the same kind of spirit that was operating in Jezebel or operating in Delilah with those attributes. You can tell the type of spirit that's at work by the fruit. 
The Holy Spirit has fruit. Right. The Bible lays out the fruit, the evidence of his presence. Well, these evil spirits, these unclean spirits, they have fruit also. Some of that fruit is adultery. Some of that fruit is perversion. Some of that fruit is night terror. Some of that fruit is fear, suicide, and thoughts. And so those fruits are the evidence of the presence of demon spirits. Now, some of these spirits, when we say it's a Delilah spirit or a Jezebel spirit, we're talking about those spirits that were associated with the attributes of Jezebel. Right. Now, I'll I'll say this, man. A lot of people get into, they call everybody a Jezebel spirit. And a lot of the people that, that are being identified as Jezebel are not actually, it's not that. Agreed. They think that every woman who seems to be controlling or has to have the control of everything has a Jezebel spirit. No, she has a manipulative spirit. She has a controlling, perhaps a controlling spirit. It doesn't mean it's Jezebel. It also, she may not have a controlling spirit at all. You just may have a problem following sound advice. You know, that could be that too. But um, Jesus addresses Jezebel in Revelation. And I don't believe that he was referencing a physical person, but was addressing the spirit behind the false teacher. So when you talk about Jezebel, what's, what is it, what's the fruit or the attributes of Jezebel? So you look at what Jezebel did in the Old Testament with Ahab and with Elijah. Jezebel always seeks to control authority. Okay. Jezebel, what, Jezebel was a setup girl. Jezebel, Ahab married Jezebel. Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal. Okay, he was a high priest of Baal. Her father was a high priest of Baal, and most likely she was also a priestess of Baal, born in that house. He marries her through a through really demonic a demonic unction. He marries this woman. It was a setup so that Satan could attempt to afflict Israel. So he marries her. What's the first thing she does when she is made queen? She seeks to cut off the worship of Jehovah. Then she seeks to silence the prophetic voice, kill the prophets. Jezebel, listen, people are calling all these people, you know, you got Jezebel. No, you don't. Because Jezebel, first off, is not concerned with the average Christian. Jezebel is only concerned with fivefold office gifts and governmental authority. That's where Jezebel really operates. Okay? Jezebel seeks to control governmental authority and silence the fivefold office gifts, specifically the prophetic voice, and to cut off the worship of Jehovah. So if you see yeah. the worship, the true worship of Yahweh being cut off or polluted, and prophetic voices being silenced, forced to be afraid to speak righteousness, Elijah ran and hid in a cave. Okay? They had to hide the prophets in a cave to keep them from Jezebel she was systematically trying to root them out. When you see prophetic voices trying to hide, trying to be silenced, the worship being diluted of Jehovah and governmental authority being influenced by that, that is what true Jezebel is is operating behind. Jezebel is a more higher ranking spirit. Okay. Jezebel is not afflicting the common housewife or the, you know, that's not, they might have other issues. It might be manipulation. It could be unforgiving, all these other issues. And I'm not saying they don't have issues with spirits but it's just not Jezebel. I don't don't care. It's just not. And then you look at Jesus. Let scripture interpret scripture. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, you've suffered that woman Jezebel to teach falsely to cause his believers, his body to worship things, to worship idols and to commit what? Sexual sin, to commit fornication. This was a teacher in the church had been influenced by this Jezebel spirit to do what? to influence, to institute Baal and Astra worship by cutting off the true worship of Jehovah and by teaching the believers that it was okay to commit idolatry and to commit sexual sin. So if you find churches, so-called churches and ministries and pulpits that try to tell you that it's okay to commit sexual sin and it is okay to incorporate all these other things, they are operating with a Jezebel spirit. That is what the Jezebel spirit is. Delilah, I would say most believers are probably more afflicted with a Delilah type spirit than they are a Jezebel spirit. Delilah was a setup girl by the Philistines. Samson had an anointing, a great anointing upon his life to be the deliverer of God 
for the people of Israel. Satan was afraid of that anointing. The Philistines, that demonized, entire demonized culture, was afraid of Samson because of his great feats of strength under the anointing of God. And so they had to figure out the source of his power. They wanted to destroy his power. Satan, the, Satan, the demonic realm, want to take the anointing. They want to take your source of power with God from you. That's their number one thing. And so Samson was a Nazarite consecrated to Nazareth. What were some of the things that he was forbidden to do? He was forbidden to drink wine or to touch anything from the fruit of the vine. Right. Okay, he was for, forbidden to touch anything dead. Okay. And so he had, he, there, was, there was an area of consecration in his life. And he had this issue with Canaanite women that he should have never been involved with. His first wife was a Canaanite woman and it was a disaster. His parents had to try to figure out how to get him out of that arrangement. And then he kept going and going and going to places he shouldn't have went. Finally, he goes into the Valley of Sorek. He, he sees Delilah. Well, what's that word in the Hebrew, Sorek? Place of the vine. He went where he should have never went. He wasn't allowed to touch anything from the vine. He went where he should have never gone. And he saw Delilah and she enticed him. She looked good. And he said, I want some of this. And so she was a setup girl. She's like that girl when we were in the streets before I got saved, the girl that would lure you to a hotel room if you were married and her boys would be waiting in the bathroom and then they would come out and jump you and take your wallet and take your money and you could never report it. Why? Well, because who are you going to report it to? You weren't supposed to be there. You've got a business. You've got a, you got a wife or a family. So they set, completely set you up. The Lila was a plant from the Philistines to set up Samson. They wanted to figure out how to somehow Stop this anointing from destroying them, this power that would afflict them. So they said to Delilah, they said, Delilah, I could figure this out. We'll get her in his bedroom. He liked her and he brought her in. And you, I mean, you know the story. He laid his head in the lap of Delilah and she, he, he said, well, do this. And then he, she would do that. It wouldn't work. Finally, the constant persistence, he figured he'd just shut her up and he told her the truth. And then what happens? I, he, he was bound. He lost his strength. The Bible says one of the saddest verses in Scripture, he woke up and wist not or knew not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. How many pulpits today are preaching and have no idea the Lord has departed? And then they take him, they bind him, and they pluck out his eyes, take his eyes, because Satan's number one tactic is not just to take your, your strength, your source of power, but to take your vision. Yeah. To take your vision. Because if you've got no vision, you're at the mercy of the person leading you. Yeah. And so... They take him and they, I mean, they put him in the house of Dagon. They make sport of him. They mock him. That's the, that's the end result of demonization. They want to mock you. They want to make you feel low. They want to destroy you, condemnation. But his hair began to grow again. And God restored him. And he killed more in his death than at any time during his life. So, but those spirits are active. But when you, you know, a spirit of Delilah is a spirit that seeks to entice the believer, to cause them to, um, forsake their anointing or to lose, to lose that. But it doesn't matter where you are, what place of the process you are. God can deliver you from all of that. Yeah. I, uh, I want the listeners and those that are watching to really understand what he's saying with those breakdowns is you're not actually talking about quote unquote Jezebel or Delilah coming in. These are the characteristics yeah of um these individuals that are likened unto um a spirit in other words uh we mentioned spirit of depression or spirit of suicide yep. that's not the one spirit that's labeled depression or suicide and that one spirit is doing all those things Th those are characteristics within that and mm -hmm. i think that's important for people to understand but i want to encourage the people right now because we're going to have to do this again because this is one of these things that when you open up, there's so much depth to this conversation and, you know, taking something like casting out devils yeah. is something that is, we can expound on it, expound on it, and we need to expound on it. So I want to set this up again to be able to do with Chad in the future, but yeah. I want the people to understand how to get in touch with Chad. I want, you have a podcast, you yeah. have books that are out. Your most recent book really is mm -hmm. a handbook, a, a guidebook on casting out devils. And I want you to tell people again, how can they find you? How can they find these books? 
uh, these these are very very profound uh, yeah. instruments. I believe that people need to uh, get and tell people too about your new podcast. Where to find that okay. as well? Yeah, so our our podcast is Voice of Revival. So the Voice of Revival podcast got a sign over my head there, but uh, you can get you can subscribe to, download, check out Voice of Revival. I'm, we're on Spotify, I, you know, Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Castbox, all the different places that you can find pretty much any place you can get a podcast downloaded it's available there so just type in voice of revival and it'll be the one with my picture on it my name um, chad mcdonald so definitely check out voice of revival i've got a youtube channel titled the same thing voice of revival was really just the media broadcast outreach part of revival fire world ministries that's our ministry name revival fire world ministries and you can check our website out at www.revivalfirewm Dot com. So that's revivalfirewm.com. And all five of the books that I've written are there on the website. You can just go to the website and click the link for store. And all five books are there. Uh, Rise and Be Healed, um, Greater Works, um, Prayer That Makes Hell Tremble, um, Defeating Delilah. And the newest one we talked about today is Casting Out Devils, a handbook for operating in the supernatural power of deliverance. Those are all there on the website at revivalfirewm.com and of course on social media uh, you can check us out at revivalfirewm that's our social media handle for um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and Parlor. so I don't get I don't mess around with the other ones but <laughs> I want to encourage everybody that's listening or watching to really connect with the ministry there with Chad at Revival Fire um, he's one of the few individuals that I know personally that will go to the places that other people love to talk about, but seldom ever actually venture into doing. Now, a lot of times we talk about uh, going out in the mission field. Pe most people are only willing to go if they can find that five-star hotel that they can suffer for Jesus with. Chad goes to the places that the average person just isn't willing to go. And, uh, you know, these are places that are, are definitely needed and on the radar, but that like anything else in ministry, um, you know, the message of the cross is free, but the means necessary to provide it and get it to these places aren't necessarily free. It costs money. Um, and that's just a reality that we live in. You know, we, we love to see the pictures of the Bibles that are being sent to these countries that mm -hmm. are free Bibles to them. But it didn't, it wasn't free getting it there. They had, yeah. the Bibles had to be bought. You know, there had to be planes, there had to be fuel, there had to be shipping, there had to be taxes, all this stuff. And so Chad has a ministry that I want to encourage you to support in any way that you possibly can. Even if you can't financially, support him in prayer. I know his wife will greatly appreciate it. His children will appreciate it. Chad was uh, in a country not long ago when the world was shutting down. And mm. he was still preaching the gospel there and setting people free. So check out these websites. They're on the YouTube link as well. And I'll share them on the Apple Podcast, Spotify, through the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Chad, thank you so, so much yes, for being a part of this. We will do this here very, very soon. We'll get more in-depth into this. There's so much information. I honor you. We love you and your family. Give our love to your wife and your children. Uh, Chad belongs to the same club that I did. We definitely married out of our league and out of our way, but nevertheless, <laughs> That's right. uh, we were able to capture the heart of our beautiful wives. And so uh, just give her her our love uh we miss you guys greatly hopefully we'll be able to uh eat a meal together yeah. here soon so any final thoughts that you want to share with the people listening no nothing that i can think of man um you know if you're listening to this podcast and you've been struggling with issues and you feel like you've got an area of your life that's being assaulted you know by demonic forces whether it's your thought life whether it's habits that you can't break free from let me encourage you that there is deliverance. Don't believe the lie of the devil that you can't ever be free. And by the power of God, I command you to be set free now in the name of Jesus Christ. There's hope. There's hope. Deliverance ministry should always end with hope and freedom. I love it. I love it. Guys, I pray that this episode has challenged you, it has equipped you, and it has encouraged you to continue to advance the kingdom of God in your purpose and your assignment for the glory and the purpose of the Lord. We love you all and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.